In the 13th century, Mongol horsemen attacked deep into Europe, devastating the countryside, sacking cities and slaughtering thousands. The armies of the Christian kingdoms fought bravely to defend their lands, from Poland and Germany to Austria, Hungary and Croatia, down to Serbia and Bulgaria. And then, the Mongol hordes suddenly withdrew, back eastwards across the steppe, leaving Europe reeling and terrified of another invasion. When would they come back? Next time, would they try to conquer all of Europe? And if they did, would the armies of Christendom be able to stop them? The ruler of the Catholic Church did not intend to be surprised again. Instead, Pope Innocent IV would send an Italian monk on a mission to the Great Khan of the Mongol Empire, bearing a letter requesting peace and asking if the Khan intended to finish what his armies had started. And so, in the year 1245, this elderly Italian monk and his small band of companions set out on an epic journey from the heart of Europe across the vast steppes to the east, crossing icy deserts, great rivers and terrifying mountain passes. Coming close to death from cold, starvation and exhaustion, they would finally reach the Mongol court near Karakoram, thousands of miles and many months later, only to find that the election of a new Great Khan was in progress. Thousands of rulers, nobles and envoys from every corner of the Mongol Empire had come to take part and to pay tribute to the new ruler. Amazingly, our Italian monk wrote down a full record of his incredible journey, the spectacular scenes he witnessed and what happened when he delivered the Pope's letter to the new Great Khan of the Mongols. This is the incredible story of Giovanni del Pian del Carpini. This video is sponsored by Babbel. You know, I read a lot of old archaeology texts when researching stuff for my novels and this channel, and most of the time I can find what I need to. But there's tons of research about the cultures of the ancient steppe from decades ago that I want to use, and it's all in Russian. So I decided to learn how to read a bit of Russian. I tried teaching myself the alphabet first because it didn't seem that hard, but I just kept giving up. That's when I started using Babbel. It's the number one language learning app in the world, and it's great because there are so many different courses to choose from for each language. I started with a beginner course, but I'm also doing the alphabet and Russian geography, and there's one on museums, which will come in handy. You can choose how long you want to spend on each lesson, even just 5 or 10 minutes a day, and how you want to schedule it. But the best thing, I think, is that the lessons are interactive. It has speech recognition to help you improve your pronunciation and accent. Volgograd. Volgograd. It's not just Russian, of course. You can learn French, German, Spanish, and loads more. So if you want to start speaking a new language in just a few weeks, then use the link in the description below to get 65% off your subscription to Babbel. Thank you to Babbel for sponsoring this video. So who was this man? Why did the Pope choose him for this important mission? Well, he was born around 1185 in Umbria in central Italy, and he was a disciple of St. Francis of Assisi. And as a Franciscan friar, he was committed to a life of poverty as he helped to spread the teachings of his order to new lands like Spain and North Africa. When the Mongol armies attacked Northern Europe, Giovanni was posted in Germany. At around 60 years old by this point, he had a lifetime of experience in travelling to different kingdoms and dealing with local rulers on behalf of his order, and by extension the Pope. Clearly, he was a trustworthy man, and when the Pope called upon him to undertake this task, he accepted. The Pope at this time resided in the French city of Lyon, and that's where Giovanni set off from on Easter Day, 16th of April, 1245, carrying a letter from the Pope to the Mongol Khan, wherever he was in the lands far to the east. Because when he set off, he didn't know exactly where he was going, or how to get there, nor how far it was, or how long it would take. He had no map. And although a small number of Europeans had by this point taken service with the Mongols, voluntarily or otherwise, no one had recorded anything or sent word back. But he planned first of all to reach the land of the Russians. So he set off across Europe, passing through Germany. He was accompanied by two more Franciscan friars called Stephen and Celslus of Bohemia, and they had a handful of servants to help them with their wagons and animals. They soon reached Wenceslas I, the King of Bohemia, one of the few Christian lords to have defeated the Mongols who invaded his kingdom. 
Giovanni knew the king already, and Wenceslas was happy to provide advice on how to proceed. He also gave them money for travelling expenses and sent them with an escort to his nephew in Poland. This nephew also provided an escort, travelling expenses and letters of safe conduct to take them on to Kiev. Now this part of the journey was incredibly dangerous. Giovanni says in his written account that so many Russian men had been killed and taken into slavery by the Mongols that the pagan Lithuanians now committed outrages as much as possible in the country of Russia especially those places through which they travelled. But by God's grace, the friars were escorted by a Russian duke who guided and protected them on the way to Kiev. Not only that, this duke had diplomatic experience with the Mongols. He explained they would have to take rich presents to give to the Mongol lords. This gift-giving practice was an ancient tradition and these gifts would have to be worthy or they would have no help on their journey. The friars, therefore, purchased whatever beaver skins and other furs they could afford, and they were blessed by the charity of the duke, the duchess, some local knights and the local bishop with generous gifts of even more furs. As it turned out, this small fortune in their wagons would still not be enough. When they reached Kiev, one of the friars, Stephen of Bohemia, became too ill to travel and was left behind with two servants and their old horses but they had been joined by another Franciscan friar known as Benedict of Poland. Gifted in languages, Benedict would serve as the party's interpreter. They were still in Europe, but had already been travelling for almost a year, going from city to city. After making preparations at Kiev, which Giovanni calls the metropolis of Russia, they left the city riding hardy steppe ponies on a freezing February morning in 1246, heading out into the unknown. Crossing the Dnieper at Kaniv, a town under direct Mongol rule, they were given fresh horses and escorted on to another town. This was ruled by an Alan. The Alans were an ancient steppe people, basically descended from the Scythians, who had largely submitted to the Mongols. Giovanni calls this Alan a man full of malice and iniquity, because he extorted a vast amount of the furs and precious things meant for the Mongols. But after being robbed three ways from Sunday, finally they were released and sent eastwards once more. Four days later, on the steppe, the party made camp at sunset and were set upon by a company of Mongol horsemen galloping in amongst them in a horrible fashion, demanding to know who they were. They replied that they were envoys of the Lord Pope, sent because he desired that Christians should be friends of the Mongols and at peace with them. The Pope also wished that all Mongols would become Christians. He also wished to express outrage and offence at their slaughtering of Christians, especially Hungarians, Moravians and Poles, who were his subjects, when they had done nothing to them. He also wished to know their intentions for Christendom. Giovanni would have to repeat these points again and again to every Mongol lord he was passed to over the next few months and the Mongol lords understood by these answers that some distant lord from the west was offering subjugation to the Great Khan. So they were sent on and on, from chief to chief, ever eastwards across the steppe. The friar's account describes passing through the lands of the Cumans, a Turkic people subject to the Mongols. And he talks of crossing four mighty rivers, first of all the Dnieper, of course, which he describes as the border of Russia, and then the Don, the Volga, and finally the Ural River. He names the great lords who control each river valley and describes how in the winter they descend to the shores of the Black Sea or the Caspian and in summer they take their armies north. And initially the friars were rushed to the mighty Volga which was controlled by one of the great Mongol Khans, a grandson of Genghis himself, Batu. Giovanni says Batu alone had 60,000 horsemen and was more powerful than all the other Mongol princes save the emperor. When they reached the great camp of Batu, the friars were made to pitch their tents a long way from the Khan. Imagine a vast encampment with tents in groups as far as the eye could see with the ruler of the horde in the centre. There were thousands of horses grazing all around beyond the edges of the camp and far over the horizon. Batu's slave stewards came to ask what these friars wanted and to ask what presents they brought for the Khan. By this point, the friars had already been fleeced half a dozen times and explained that although they had little left, they would hand over what they could. It still wasn't enough for Batu and they ended up handing over almost everything they had. 
and they still had more than 4,000 kilometers to go before they reached their ultimate destination. Eventually, they were to be brought to Batu's tents, but first they would have to take part in a strange custom. They had to pass through two raging fires. This they refused to do. Fear not, they were told. The tradition of the fire was meant only to cleanse any poison they might carry or any bad intentions they might have for the great lord. So they accepted and passed between the two fires. There were other important customs the friars had to follow when they met with Mongol lords. Making a mistake in etiquette could have deadly consequences. They were warned repeatedly never to step on the threshold of the chief's tent or they would be put to death. Seating arrangements inside were also dictated by ancient custom, with the men on one side and the women on the other. Batu's tents were large and handsome and were in fact plunder, having originally belonged to the king of Hungary. Giovanni describes Batu, quote, Batu is kind enough to his own people, but he is greatly feared by them. He is, however, most cruel in a fight. He is very shrewd and extremely crafty in warfare, for he has been waging war for a long time." End quote. When they were shown in, being very careful not to put a foot wrong, they had to kneel and state their business through translators. The language barrier was a common problem on their journey. Batu had to send for more interpreters to come to him, and so the friars had to wait in their tents on the edge of the camp while they were hardly fed at all. Eventually the letters were translated, and Batu agreed that the friars must be sent on at full speed to his cousin in the east in the Mongol heartlands. But after travelling so long through the winter and being half-starved, Giovanni was in poor health. He says, quote, We started out most tearfully, not knowing whether we were going to life or death. We were furthermore so feeble that we could hardly ride. During the whole of that Lent, our only food had been millet with salt and water, and likewise on the other fast days, nor had we anything else to drink but snow melted in the kettle." End quote. Despite his weakness, they were now hurtled on at astonishing speeds, changing their tired horses for fresh ones between five and seven times a day, and they kept this up for weeks on end. They rode through lands devastated by the Mongol invasions. In one place they found many human skulls and bones scattered about on the ground like cattle dung. Of the peoples they encountered, some were pagans and some were Muslims, but none tilled the soil, living solely on the produce of their animals, nor did they build houses, but lived year-round in tents. And the Mongols had defeated them all, occupying these many lands, the survivors having been reduced to slavery. In late June, they reached the Altai Mountains in the west of Mongolia, which was the land of the Naimans, one of the first peoples defeated by the campaigns of Genghis Khan. There was a great snowfall, and it was incredibly cold as they rode through the mountains. On the other side, they finally reached the homeland of the Mongols, and they journeyed through that land for three more weeks, riding hard, arriving on the 22nd of July. Quote, All along this route we travelled very fast. We had to rise at dawn and travel till night without a stop. Often we arrived so late that we did not eat at night, but instead in the morning. And we went as fast as the horses could trot, for there was no lack of horses. And in this fashion we rode rapidly along without interruption. End quote. And then they arrived, finally, at the great camp of the Mongol court. There were thousands of people filling the land all around. All the great Mongol lords and envoys from subjugated peoples from every corner of the Mongol Empire had come to this distant place because Anu Kagan, only the third ever great lord of the empire, was about to be elected. This was the Kurul Tai, and what an incredible spectacle it would be. The new emperor would be Goyuk, son of Ogodai and grandson of Genghis Khan, but the friars arrived before his formal election. The court was held in a vast tent that Giovanni estimates could hold more than 2,000 people. Outside of it, the great chiefs and their men went about everywhere armed and charged about the countryside on horseback, their horses shining with a fortune of gold upon them. Day after day, these chiefs held council to discuss the election, which they did until about noon, when, as Giovanni says, they began drinking mare's milk 
and they drank until evening so plentifully that it was a rare sight. This was fermented alcoholic mare's milk and the friars refused to drink it, but they were generously given mead instead. Giovanni recognizes this as a great honor. He says that their Mongol hosts encouraged them to keep drinking and to become intoxicated, but relented when the friars made it clear that they didn't want to. The Kuril Tai, the election of a new supreme ruler, was a special event. After all, it was about the future of the Mongol people and their empire, and it was intensely political at every level, with chiefs great and small and their wives and families making new deals and alliances. But it was also a kind of festival where normal activities were suspended for feasting and drinking in an outpouring of great energy. It's remarkable to have an account of this grand occasion by an outsider. Through his writings, you can detect the festival atmosphere, the vitality of the attendees, and the immense political power on display. There were in attendance more than 4,000 representatives from every corner of the empire. There was a Duke of Russia, several princes of the Turkic tribes of Central Asia, two sons of the King of Georgia, a dozen or more sultans from the Muslim world, and an ambassador from the Caliph of Baghdad. In fact, this would be the last Caliph of Baghdad because the Mongols would conquer it about 12 years later, ending the Abbasid Caliphate. And they all brought spectacular gifts of silk, furs, and gold and silver, filling 500 wagons as well as countless camels and armoured horses. The friars were there for a month, and although the election was made during this time, there was no proclamation. As far as Giovanni could tell, Goyek was just suddenly treated as the new Khan of Khans. And in August, they all decamped to a new place, a few miles away, where Goyek sat in his tent on the imperial seat, and all his subjects came one after the other to kneel before him. Giovanni makes the point of saying that he, did not do this. Then there followed many days of feasting and drinking. During these long weeks, the friars and their servants were treated poorly. They were given food enough for one person to be shared amongst the four of them. Only the charity of a Ruthenian goldsmith in service to the emperor kept them alive. This Slavic goldsmith was the man who had constructed the golden throne and the emperor's golden seal. There were quite a few Slavs and Hungarians there in the camp, some who claimed to have been in service with the Mongols for as long as 30 years, others 10 or 20. Finally, through a series of secretaries and translators, the friars were summoned to deliver the message of the Pope to the new emperor. They were asked what gifts they would be presenting to the most powerful lord in the world, but by this point they had nothing left to give. Compared to even the humblest Mongol chieftain, the Lord Pope must have seemed a rather inconsequential figure. When Giovanni is admitted into the presence of Goyuk, he describes him like this, quote, The emperor may be 40 or 45 years old or more. He is of medium stature, very prudent and extremely shrewd, and serious and sedate in his manners, and he has never been seen to laugh lightly or show any levity, end quote. The friars believed his serious manner was evidence that the emperor was about to become a Christian, something they had been assured of by Christians in the emperor's household. In fact, there were Christian Mongols, and there had been for centuries, but Goyek would not become one, and if he did, he certainly would not become a Catholic. Once the Lord Pope's messages were presented, a written reply was made by the new emperor and the friars were sent home again. The emperor considered sending his ambassadors back to the Pope along with them, but Giovanni was afraid these men would function as spies, and so talked the Mongols out of it. He was also afraid that these envoys would be killed in Europe, which would certainly bring the wrath of the emperor down upon them all. The emperor's mother gave them generous gifts before they departed, which were immediately stolen by their escorts. The journey home was long and arduous, especially as by this time they were travelling mostly through winter. He says they were resting most of the time in the snow in the desert. It sounds appalling, and Giovanni was in his 60s. In May 1247, they reached Batu on the Volga, who sent them on to the next lord, ruling the Don, who sent them on to the lord of the eastern side of the Dnieper. They finally reached Kiev in June. They had been gone from there for 16 months. And the companions they'd left behind, like Stephen of Bohemia, quote, came out to meet us rejoicing and congratulated us as if we had risen from the dead. 
and so they did to us throughout Russia, Poland, and Bohemia." End quote. Now, pride is the father of all sins, of course, but you can feel the friar's deep satisfaction at having completed such an immense and unlikely journey. Every lord who hosted them back westwards across Christendom begged them for the whole story and everything they had learned about the Mongols. He passed on information about their customs and traditions, their manner of making war and the tactics they employed, and the nature of the distant lands and peoples of the East. And then finally, he reached the Pope in Lyon. He had been away for over two years, and in total he had travelled about 10,000 miles, or 16,000 kilometres. The Pope had requested peace, and now Giovanni delivered Goyek's reply. The letter starts with the following. We, by the power of eternal heaven, Khan of the great state, our command. The rest of the letter says, quote, You must say with a sincere heart, We will be your subjects, we will give you our strength. You must come in person with your kings, all together, without exception, to render us service and pay us homage. Only then will we acknowledge your submission. And if you do not follow the order of God and go against our orders, we will know you as our enemy." End quote. So the Lord Pope had his answer. As a reward for his service, in 1248, Giovanni da Pian del Carpini was made an Archbishop in Dalmatia. He died a few years later, in 1252, when he was about 67 years old. He had led an extraordinary life in the service of his order, the Pope and Christendom and secured everlasting fame by his astonishing, epic journey. If you enjoy my videos, please subscribe on Patreon to get access to exclusive content and to help me make more videos like this in the future. Now, please watch this video on the life of a very different medieval figure, Vlad the Impaler. Thank you for watching.